morning, everyone. Um, so a, a slight difference in, in tack now because um, I'm going to focus on food security issues in uh, developing countries. Um, and in particular, I look at uh, two basic questions. Uh, the first one is what is the potential for reducing the number of undernourished and for um, increasing food production, especially in developing countries. So what is the potential? But uh, the second question is more on, uh, is that potential, can it be realized? Um, what is necessary in terms of incentives and policies to try and make a, a desirable outcome uh, come about? Now, um, what I will say is, is largely based on the work that we do um, in what we call our Global uh, Perspective Studies Unit. And um, some of you may have seen these periodic uh, volumes that come out of that unit, which are usually called something like Agriculture Towards 2015, 2020, whatever. Um, the first, first work I personally ever did for FAO was developing the methodologies for agriculture towards 2000. Um, I, I am, so before anybody asks, no, I haven't looked back to see uh, uh, whether it all came true. Um, the most recent uh, of these publications, we, we switched the title rather, and it was called Feeding the World in 2050. And that's the end point that I'm aiming at today. Um, the, uh, although what I will say is based on, on this work, um, it's not possible really in the time available to give a, a complete picture of you know, how this uh, work is done. And so what I'll do is present a few snapshots which illustrate some aspects of the problem and some of the kind of considerations that, that we're working on. Um, so it's uh, not a, an exposition of how we do it, it's just some of the, some of the results. Um, where are we now? Uh, what's the starting point? Well, um, this, this picture shows how uh, the number of undernourished and the percentage of populations undernourished has changed uh, in the um, last uh, 16, 20 years. And as you can see from the left-hand side, uh, there's not actually been that much progress in reducing uh, the number of people undernourished in the world. And uh, the, uh, there are particular problems in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Uh, the picture looks a bit brighter if you look at the percentage of populations that are undernourished, and it looks like um, there's been quite a dramatic reduction. Um, some of you may be aware of the estimates we do each year of the um, number of undernourished in the world, which we publish in a, a publication, an FAO publication called The State of Food Insecurity in the World. Um, recently, we've revised the methodologies there, and it may be that, in fact, we've been making better progress in reducing food insecurity than uh, we had first thought. Um, nevertheless, um, the picture is, is, is pretty grim, I think, and, and the latest estimates that we have uh, for sort of 2010 or so, again, show around 800 million or a little more uh, uh, food insecure around the world. Now, <clears throat> in the, um, up to 2050, uh, globally, we'll have an additional uh, 2.5 billion people to feed, so we'll be reaching a, a global population of a, around 9 billion. And um, that is the, the growth rate that we are expecting over the period up to 2050 in population is rather less than um, we've seen in the past. So if you look at the previous 45 years, 
Um, we had an additional 3.5 billion. That's an, an annual average growth rate of about 1.7. Uh, what the UN population forecasts are now suggesting is that um, it will be about 0.75% uh, per annum. So one of the key drivers of um, food consumption in the world then should be making life a little easier for us uh, over uh, the next um, uh, few years. Um, there tends to be a focus on the absolute numbers of people that we have to feed uh, in the world when we're looking forward and talking about food security. I think it's also very important to, th to consider other demographic drivers, uh, notably things like urbanization. And if, if you look, for example, at how food consumption patterns have changed in China, then you can see that there are many other social and demographic factors which are, are driving that. The um, population is one of the main drivers of, of food security in the world, or food insecurity. The other one is income. And of course, um, this is where population changes rather slowly and is relatively easy to project, income is much less easy to, to project. What I've gathered together here is, is a number of uh, alternative projections of where per capita income levels will be in 2050 um, compared with uh, 2007. The, um, I think what's most interesting and perhaps most significant about this picture is not the actual uh, levels of per capita income, but it's rather the relationship between per capita incomes in different regions. And in particular, we can see that although there's uh, agreement that there will be quite good income growth, for example, in East Asia, in Latin America, sadly, there is also uh, agreement that income growth in sub-Saharan Africa and to a lesser extent in South Asia will uh, be rather constrained. What that means, looking at the population trends in the different regions and the income trends, is that we're likely to see an increasing concentration uh, of undernourishment in sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia. So in many ways, more of the same. And uh, the, the scale of the uh, units are not here. On the left-hand side of this diagram, this is millions of, of people. The right-hand side is percentages. And uh, as you can see, up to 2050, we are expecting quite a sharp fall in the percentage of populations that are undernourished. Uh, but it still remains pretty high in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. That's the, the main focus, I, I think, of our efforts in uh, FAO. Now, what about the future production patterns to uh, achieve this, this level of, um, of food security? Well, um, one of the points that, that Jamie already made is that if, if you look at what is, how much we need to increase uh, food production over the period up to 2050, and you compare that um, with how food production increased up to, you know, up to about now, uh, then what you see is that there is uh, a rather, in some, you might say, easier task. You know, uh, we don't need to increase production as much uh, in up to 2050 as we did do um, up to 2007, 2010. Um, so uh, the um, 
that gives us some uh, grounds for comfort, perhaps, that the task before us um, is not uh, quite so daunting um, and, and is potentially achievable. Now, in spite of that um, reduction in the amount of, of, uh, f of additional food that we need to produce in percentage terms, um, the volume increases are still sizable. So what this picture shows you is for major crops and products around the world, it shows you where we see uh, the major uh, demands. You see there's a big increase in maize there. That's uh, very much associated with uh, biofuels, and it's very much associated with livestock feed. Um, so in terms of the consumption pattern, you know, even in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we see a, a shift towards increasing consumption of livestock products and vegetable oils as well. So uh, can we actually produce all this, this food? Um, Basically, to meet the increased food uh, demands, you can either uh, increase the amount of land that you uh, use, or you, in you can increase what you get from that land. And uh, there is some uh, potential for increasing um, the uh, amount of land under, under cultivation. And this is very much concentrated, as you see from this picture, in sub-Saharan Africa and in Latin America. Um, what these figures are perhaps in, in some ways misleading because they're based on agroecological zone uh, data. And, and so a lot of what is potentially available uh, for increased agricultural production, especially in developed countries, is only actually available, you know, if you demolish all the, the houses, if you ignore environmentally sensitive zones and, and so on. But it, it does appear that there is some scope for expanding the amount of land under cultivation, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa and in, in Latin America. And in fact, um, half of the potentially usable land that's available, you know, for uh, production is in a handful of countries. It's Brazil, it's Argentina, it's Sudan, it's Congo, uh, it's Mozambique. Um, so it's actually very concentrated in, in those kind of countries. But I think it's important to stress also that potential land includes land which in some cases will be environmentally uh, extremely fragile. So the scope for increasing land use, but the main uh, driver has got to be yield growth, productivity and yield growth. And in, in fact, 73%, so nearly three quarters of the additional food has got to come um, from yield growth. And what that implies in turn is productivity increases, obviously, which implies investment and which implies that the incentives uh, for productivity increase uh, are actually going to be there. Now, the, uh, the picture, if you look at uh, how yields are uh, now and what we need uh, in 2050, um, then that's what's illustrated here. And so you can see that the big uh, yield increases also are needed in the developing world particularly. And that you can also see that the yield gaps between uh, uh, different regions are very, very significant. Now, there's a lot of talk uh, recently about um, yield gaps. Um, what is actually relevant is not the yield gaps between, say, sub-Saharan Africa and, say, uh, East Asia. What is actually relevant in terms of yield gaps is between what is actually being achieved in terms of productivity in a particular region and what is the potential under field conditions within that region. 
So it, it's, it's a question of how do you move up to the local uh, productivity frontier, the efficiency frontier. And those yield gaps uh, can be extremely significant. So in sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of the survey work suggests that that yield gap can be as much as 75%. So they're only getting 25% of uh, the, the, the yield that is, is potential. If you could close the yield gaps around the globe um, for the top 16 crops, you would get something like a 55% increase in the number of calories available. So it's a very significant uh, effort. Now, the, the big question, of course, is how do you f close that yield gap? Um, there's a lot of focus have been on the need for expanding research and development. Um, I'm personally not sure ab about that. I think what the issue here is a question of adoption, that in many developing countries, the yield gaps that we see reflect uh, constrained choices made under uncertainty, uh, poor information, and risk. And so the policy issues is, is how do you address those? How do you promote adoption? Um, just in, in passing a couple of slides, um, the first is that um, irrigation uh, is, is key to in improving yield. Um, what we see at the moment, though, is extreme pressure on water resources in a, a number of locations around the world, and we also see a great deal of inefficient use of water. So again, there are policy issues there. Um, Again, very briefly, um, improving productivity uh, will imply greater use of fertilizers. Again, on this picture, uh, we're showing the current fertilizer usage and what would be needed uh, in 2050. And as you can see, there are fairly substantial increases required from very, very low levels uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. And we don't expect that fertilizer use in those countries um, will improve significantly. Um, again, uh, of course, the big uncertainty in the future is climate change. Uh, what this picture shows um, is uh, different projections of the impact on crop yields made by different groups studying climate change. And uh, as you can see, um, there is a, a great diversity. There's also a great diversity of opinion, uh, certainly amongst colleagues uh, within FAO, about the dynamics of climate change and when uh, climate change, uh, uh, unstable weather patterns and increasing frequency of weather shocks and so on will kick in, whether it's already happened, um, as is uh, often said, or whether um, it's to come, you know, in another 10, 20 years. Okay, now we've heard uh, some uh, talk about the future of prices and um, so I'd just like to end uh, with some comments on this. Um, what we see um, is pretty much as, as has been said by our colleagues from ABARES this morning, that um, we see uh, high prices continuing, uh, not quite at the peaks that they were up in, in necessarily in 2008. Um, but nevertheless higher than their historical uh, trend values. And we also see continuing volatility in prices, uh, partly because of links with oil prices through biofuels and so on, um, and also possibility of continuing links with uh, financial markets as well. Now, the question is, um, when, as in 2007, 8, again in 2010, and more recently last uh, summer, um, we, we have the highest prices that we've seen in real terms for 30 years, what is uh, the likely impact on supply response? And as Jamie mentioned earlier, um, ABEAR is, is expecting that um, there will be a supply response and it will be that that will contain prices. 
Um, I, I wouldn't disagree with that on a global scale, but uh, I think when you start looking at developing countries and this urgent need to increase uh, productivity, then you have to uh, look at the kind of constraints that developing country agriculture faces. You have to look at questions of the extent to which these high prices get transmitted back to producers and do actually uh, provide an incentive for um, uh, increased production. And also, um, producers will not respond solely to high prices. There's much more that enters into their decision-making set than just output prices if they eventually reach uh, developed country producers. So governments are going to need to work hard to uh, put into place policies which will actually uh, provide an enabling environment for investment and for productivity increase. So just some conclusions uh, looking forward. Um, there's uh, any, any exercise in, in looking forward like this up to 2050 faces all kinds of uncertainties. Uh, uncertainties particularly of the impact of climate change at the moment, but also the future of biofuels and other non-food agricultural uses. Uh, we believe that there is the potential to feed 9 billion people in 2050. There will be major regional differences with Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia lagging behind and so con continuing uh, food insecurity uh, problems in those uh, regions. The urgent need is to increase productivity, especially in those lagging regions and, uh, and also in a sustainable way. And so there's a responsibility on governments to create that enabling environment uh, for increased investment and increased productivity and production. Thank you, I'll stop there. <laughs>